Yeah, we're trying a, a third uh, take on this uh, paper, which uh, the robust, uh, it's about uh, exploring, exploring this uh, normalization and transformation techniques for the purpose of uh, constructing gene co-expression networks. And again, I, uh, I remind you that I chose this paper because I was interested in all these uh, normalization methods that they, uh, they consider here and all sorts of combinations. And that's, uh, that was, they even provide the, the code in the repository, how to apply these on a large number of data sets. So that was the, the motivation for, for going into this. Now, again, <laughs> I guess I should still re review some of the, the initial uh, the work that's been done in this paper just to catch up. Um, they actually divide uh, these uh, processing methods of the RNA-seq samples into three, uh, three uh, categories of, of uh, pre-processing uh, or normalization and transformation. Uh, in numerical transformations, let's say. Um, and they are within sample normalization, you know, the, what we usually have here too, uh, like CPM, TPM, and RPKM. But it's also uh, between, between sample normalization, which is usually, uh, it's often considered for differential expression uh, protocols. And, um, <coughs> Once the correlation is computed between the result of this, uh, this combination of these first two stages, um, they apply on, on variance stabiliza stabilizing transformation uh, on, on the values. And then that, after that, they compute correlations of all these values on, on, on uh, the output of uh, variance stabiliz stabilizing transformation. And uh, after the correlations are computed and um, the graph, uh, the network is, uh, are, are built, uh, they apply a third stage of uh, transformation of, but that is specifically aimed as, at adjusting uh, weights of the edges in the graph. So this later stage, it's post-correlation stage, uh, it's called network transformation in the paper. Uh, as I said, it's just about adjusting edge, edge weights um, in the resulting graph. So they follow this convention, all this, uh, these three columns we'll see in the results. Uh, you see on the right side in this coloring scheme, which is very nice for the first the three stages of, of um, transformation. So basically only the first two are about normalization. And I was looking at all this, like this is a great review of all the of many normalization methods. So the first two stages was particular interest for me because the third one is up specifically applied to the resulting networks. Uh, they have this uh, nice uh, overview using the same color scheme of, about the, uh, the transformations applied in the stages and the order that, that applies or the workflow is uh, presented here. Um, and they, uh, it's important to mention that they didn't use uh, WGCNA uh, in our, they use this uh, sleep near C++ library, which is a very capable and fast uh, li library, though uh, I'm not sure exactly how, how widespread is its use. And it seems to, the, the possibility, one of the points of uh, discussion here could be that why not trying to use WGCNA in order to, to do these benchmarks and stuff like that. They use this slightly simplified approach that's sleep near. I guess it's for efficiency method because the combination of all these methods that they investigated, like 36 workflows applied on uh, 15,000 samples or something like that, I think it's a total. Uh, I think it's, yeah, I mean, 90, 9,000 uh, GTEx samples and 6,000 SRA samples. They are grouped in data sets, of course, and they had some filtering. So the numbers are not as uh, large as they may look as <laughs> in original input, but still uh, quite impressive the way they apply all this. So yeah, given this uh, input and uh, 
this protocol. The main uh, point of any benchmark is what is the ground truth, right? So here we had this uh, very careful uh, procedure and very res somewhat restrictive. They try to to assign to decide in order to assess the accuracy of the resulting networks. Of course, we have to decide what are the true positives in the in the graph, in the network, uh, or true negative edges. I mean, when you don't have an edge, right, between two nodes in the graph. And the whole thing is built about, uh, by the way, just to be, I mean, it was obvious from the beginning that the way these gene networks are built and the way uh, uh, it's based, uh, they are based on, the way these are also considered, you know, the links between edges between uh, nodes in this graph is based on gene, uh, gene ontology co-annotation, which means that two genes are uh, annotated on the same uh, supposedly quite specific uh, gene ontology term. And in assessing the true positive edges, uh, they, they had the, this specific 600, 600 highly specific uh, Gerontology biological process terms, and also restricting uh, the experimental evidence codes they used. And they specifically tried to eliminate one of them that I crossed there in this uh, figure. Uh, they inferred from expression patterns to avoid the circular uh, reason, right? The bias uh, here, too, because this is actually working on expression data. So we don't want to use stuff that was before assigned with the same, the same idea expression uh, pattern similar, which essentially means, I guess, correlation, right? Expression pattern, they're co-expressed. Um, for the true negative edges, uh, so just to not consider uh, an edge between uh, two nodes, <laughs> uh, um, they use the, uh, of course, they had to, it was an exclusion uh, reasoning there, right? If they have a 75, a much, uh, smaller number of less specific, so higher in the gene ontology uh, hierarchy, um, like rather, rather generic uh, terms. And the idea is that you don't, you, you can assign, you can claim that these, the two genes are, are not really uh, connected or co-expressed if they are not co-annotated with any of these less specific. So they are in different categories. Uh, likely different biological processes, right? But there is also interesting that one of the requirements was, of course, to keep it uh, local as the, each gene has to at least one uh, gene ontology annotation to the set of uh, 600 original uh, highly specific terms. So basically that's the exclusion, one of the, so they, they are annotated on these highly specific terms, but not co-annotated, which means obviously, because if they are co-annotated, they would be the true positive edge. So yeah, that, there is something to uh, make maybe to discuss here, but uh, a little bit for, for later, maybe about how they establish the ground truth. That's always a complicated issue. Uh, now for the evaluation, I, I like the, they still they use the Slipner library again, because it has a lot of uh, functions, of course, to, calculate this uh, uh, you know, numerical, uh, very fast, uh, very efficient ways to calculate this. Uh, and they also use the R packages, it seems to me, right? I guess uh, Pragma packages and R package, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> this, um, to, to gather this uh, true positive false by not calculate the area after the precis precision recall curve. Um, that's what they use for the main, as a main matrix in the, in the results. They also had this, uh, I mean, I thought that the experimental design, I'm not very good at uh, assessing this, but it looks like uh, it was quite, uh, they tried to be very rigorous about it. They tried to uh, assess the, um, if the coex result, the, the, the resulting networks were significantly different in, in quality. Um, so they use this pad, the Wilcoxon rank, some tests, uh, test, and um, also some corrections for statistical assessment of this uh, significant different uh, assessment. Um, 
And uh, also, they did this experimental factor analysis, which I thought it was it showed that, I know, it looked like an interesting design to consider. Um, looked at, looking at how similar this, uh, these samples in the data set uh, are, are, so that might affect the, the um, accuracy, you know, comparing, you know, considering how independent the results are. I mean, they're all, I guess, the experimental design consideration that uh, I thought they were quite uh, thoughtful. Now to the results, because everyone wanted to hear. That was the, the part that really was a bit underwhelming considering what we see here. So if you look at the combination on the left side, right, the columns, uh, the, the order, the three columns, the colored columns on the left side there are how uh, also, you know, within sample normalization, the first stage uh, between sample normalization and network transformation, which I, it seems that it doesn't even have such a high impact, but, and there are also empty uh, boxes here. And those actually means that they actually didn't apply any transformation, right? So the most surprising finding, which uh, I don't know, throws a bit of a, uh, I don't know, it's a, a bit of a disappointment <laughs> in, in, in this is that you have these very good results when nothing, no transformation was applied. I mean, there is one thing that's been considered actually, the explanation, because the viewers immediately pointed this out. How is it possible that all this sophisticated normalization uh, um, procedures that we apply and apparently you get very good results if you don't apply any of them, which was really a kind of shocker, I suppose. Uh, so now the explanation is that, well, uh, when you assign, I mean, the authors try to thought that explain that this uh, seems to be related to the fact that the variance stabilizing transformation that it was still applied is not showing in this here, but if you look at the original protocol, they, they constantly apply this to all the combinations between com before computing the correlation. They apply this uh, arc sine uh, hyperbolic um, transformation, which is essentially like a log, a log transform, right, of the uh, uh, and of the, of the counts in this case. If you don't apply any normalization, you apply that directly to the counts, the gene uh, expression uh, counts. And um, so if you look at that, actually that, that this made it for, at least for the SRA data, but even for the GTEx data, actually, yeah, they're pretty much the same ranking. When you don't apply any anything but the uh, uh, log transform, so you work directly with the original counts without any normalization, you get very surprisingly good results. I mean, a top, a top five, top six, right? Compared to other. So this is something to, I don't know, quite uh, uh, puzzling to me. Uh, and of course, the best thing that seems to be the using between sample or uh, normalization, right? The best transformation, the CTF count, as, uh, Counts adjusted with TMM factors and uh, counts adjusted with uh, upper quartile factors, CTF and CUF there at the end of the top. So um, I guess that's a good, but if, if you look at the, the uh, mean uh, in this uh, box plots, uh, the median, I think, yeah, that's a median real, right? Uh, they are quite close, at least the, the one that they only applied the CLR transformation, the network transformation. Uh, it's the fourth, uh, fourth row, right? I highlighted it with a, a red uh, highlight there. I had to, where is my mouse again? Okay. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, so the fourth rank actually, yeah, <laughs> is uh, consistently in both data sets, just applying the CLR, right? And you know, this sixth one is really uh, actually is the third one on SRA data, which is even surprising. Yeah, it's uh, not applying anything, any transformation besides the variance stabilization, right? So uh, that was interesting. They they also had this um, uh, they call a tissue aware gold standard. They initially it was called tissue specific because they tried to 
to use the some sort of tissue specificity for this these um, networks, which didn't really work because apparently due to the low number of uh, of um, the gene ontology terms considered, uh, there's not much specificity to talk about between these uh, tissue level uh, assessments. So they, <laughs> after the viewers, the viewers pushed back, they, they call this tissue aware, just to make sure that, you know, there's still a tissue level done in, in terms of, you know, looking at the, the samples, tissue specific samples, but even though the networks resulting from that are not tissue specific necessarily. Um, so there we know these similar results. I mean, it's not because actually this tissue aware gold standard from what I understand, uh, it's actually a subset of the tissue uh, generic or tissue naive, they call it, which is a generic uh, network, uh, gold standard networks that they built. So that's why it's as expected, the results are very similar if you go at tissue level. I think that's pretty much the the main uh, the main the results that we are. I mean, the discussion is how come we have these uh, counts uh, just using the gene counts without any. We still get very good results. It's, it's that's uh, I think the most interesting thing to discuss here. Now, in summary, the uh, the points are, I would want you to to summarize here. Yes. Uh, I really appreciate that the paper went this to do this comprehensive review of all this normalization, and they provided a code there on the and actually an interesting thing, even a remarkable thing about this the whole process in, involving this paper is that one of the reviewers actually found uh, uh, checked the code and found that something was actually not properly applied there. One of the transformations which of course, uh, and pointed this out to the authors, which corrected that, which was again, impressive for considering the reviewer work doing that, right, going through the code and actually, and they had to correct that. They didn't, it didn't change much the results. It's, it was one of the, I think, uh, second stage normalizations within sample normalization, uh, the way that TMM factors uh, were, were used there uh, for correction, uh, if I recall correct. So, Still, this is a very valuable, I think the, the GitHub repository they provide along with this paper, they collected this R code to apply all this transformation and, and uh, this could be a normalization procedure, right? That, uh, and this is a good value for the community, I thought. Um, now, of course, the main discussion is about the ground truth, the way they established, they, they use this protocol that was devised apparently 14 years ago or 16 except actually in a, in a different paper related to East genes and stuff like that, or building gene networks by specific Go uh, gene ontology co-annotations. Uh, and that's, uh, I guess it's hard to, <laughs> to agree on that. Now, uh, the fact that also they didn't, it seems that these uh, gene networks were uh, in the, gold standard that they used there, it was limited enough to not be maybe largely publicized. And there was a discussion between the reviewers and the authors about making this an, an ground truth networks that they, uh, they, this, they found this way, they built this way, available to the community and more like publicized, right? And they, they aren't really there. They, they might be hidden in some data files I didn't look into if you actually open them and uh, load them somehow, but they weren't really uh, made available for wide use. And the argument from the authors was that, was that um, this is uh, limited. They have limited value maybe because they're really designed for the purpose of benchmarking, which is kind of a circular uh, reason there again, because yeah, you, how can you still trust them if you cannot easily uh, I mean, even for benchmarking purposes, I understand they could be limited, but the correctness or some sort of biological meaning underneath, underneath maybe if you can compare it and made, make it easily available, it would be useful to, uh, to consider there. But yeah, you can, as you can say that these are technical uh, you know, ground truth networks and maybe that's why they were um, not really publicized as a a wide I mean, generic gold standard for you know for deriving biological meaning and stuff like that from that. 
uh, just use it for technical purposes for this benchmark mark marks, I guess. Now another oh, oh, maybe uh, important point, as I mentioned earlier, is they use this Lipnir library uh, and a slightly more, let's say, simplistic and mostly the straightforward approach of just computing correlations and building uh, these graphs. Uh, instead of uh, more flexible approaches, I think, and somewhat, I mean, well, uh, well explored WGCNA, uh, which has a lot of support from the community. And I guess it would be easier to, to maybe look into this, uh, I mean, to appreciate the, the <laughs> outcome of this analysis if you use WGCNA in, in the process. I, I, I don't know, that could be a, something to discuss. Um, now also, this also is related to the fact that they only use Pearson correlation, uh, directly Pearson correlation, and uh, with WGCNA has slightly uh, more flexibility than, uh, even though it's still, I guess, Built around Pearson correlation, they 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 use, they use different uh, at least slightly more complex approach in in dealing with these correlation values, and especially in choosing the threshold dynamically, from what I recall. So there are other ways on building networks with WGCNA. I guess uh, yeah, I guess we we'll probably just want to open this <laughs> discussion. <laughs>